providers in Vietnam to see how many there were. There, there are lots who are offering financial services here who aren't from traditional um, banking environments. But really, the ones that maybe we should be worried about um, are the ones that come seemingly out of nowhere. If you look at that list there, Tesco and Coles are supermarkets. So they're retailers of food. Um, but in the UK, Tesco have a very big banking operation. And if you want to see what it looks like, check them out on the web. Go to the Tesco Bank website. It's a very interesting website. It's very cool. And they're attracting a lot of customers. Coles is also a supermarket in, the, uh, in Australia. And they're also offering financial services. There, there's talk about supermarkets offering financial services packages off the shelf. So you can pick a financial service package off the shelf along with your instant noodles. Um, and this is happening. Tune Money from Malaysia um, is part of the AirAsia group. So we've already heard AirAsia mentioned earlier on as an organisation that knows the space that they're playing in. Actually, AirAsia um, are very ambitious about the space that they play in. They don't only want to play in the, uh, in the air industry, they want to be like Virgin and play everywhere and chew money um, as part of the aeration group. And at the bottom there, um, how, how many people know who Alibaba are? Does anyone know? Ali, Alibaba is a, a Chinese company. Um, they have a website that connects um, people with manufacturers in China. So if you want to buy goods from China, you can go to Alibaba and find a, um, a retailer or listed on that site where they provide you um, with goods. Um, in October this year, Alibaba got themselves a banking license. So Alibaba now has a banking license, and they um, recently acquired a financial services company. So they've now got a banking license, they've got products, and they've got an absolutely enormous reach through their website and a huge number of customers. So the competition is non-traditional. So, so just to kind of sum that, summarise that up, um, what are the drivers of transformation? Why is it that banks are looking to transform customer experience? Um, I think three things, maybe. Um, one is disruptive competition of the type that I've just talked about. The second one is customers um, who are more knowledgeable um, and who are more prepared, actually, to change their financial services providers. Now, I'm, I'm 52. In, in my life, I've changed my bank maybe once or twice. Um, but now, um, customers have access, um, they have alternatives. It's very much easier for them to make those changes than I guess it was for me over my lifetime. And then the last thing is, and we heard a lot of talk about them as well, the millennials, um, young people, the kind of connected generation, the people who want to do everything via their smartphone. They're the people who are demanding that we can offer them different types of services, different levels of service, and they want to connect with you um, using a smartphone. And I'm pretty sure that everyone sitting out there now is holding one of these. And if you're holding one of these and you think about it, just through your single device, there are maybe six or seven ways that you might contact your bank. I can phone my bank, I can SMS my bank, I can email my bank, I can go to my bank's Facebook page, I can tweet about my bank, I can use a banking app, I can go to their website and surf that, all through a single device. And, and that is important because the ability to deliver service across all the channels that are available on this single device is really the one that's going to drive um, customer experience over the next few years. Okay, so a few weeks ago I was at a conference in Singapore that was about customer experience management, and I was lucky enough to hear three of the heads of transformation at some of the big regional banks give a presentation. And what was interesting about hearing those three uh, people, although they were from very different types of organisations, um, was that they, they had a very common story 
it was kind of the same when you boiled it down. And the first thing they talked about was the hurdles, how difficult it is for a bank to transform. And I guess the person who, who summed it up um, was a guy called Andrew Sidwell, who's the executive director of customer experience at DBS Bank from Singapore. And, and what he said is that the problem that all banks have when they try to transform their customer experience, when, when they try to do what um, uh, some of one of the panelists said, which is go, go outside in, if you like, is that banks just aren't designed that way. Banks are designed um, and do business in silos. And, and what does that look like? Well, it kind of looks like this. So, so the traditional banking model um, has your silo, um, lines of business, retail banking, mortgage, insurance, investment, whatever it is. And customers get what you can sell them. That, that's how it works. Um, the new model um, is customer centric. And, and that means integrating the way that the bank does business around the customer. So completely changing the way that you do business. Um, looking at your products and services, and then looking at the channels that the customer is accessing those products and services through. And, and delivering a service which enables customers to get what they want, not what you want to sell them. So, so that was a common theme. And then the second part of the common theme was how difficult that is for a bank. And all three of those people who presented put up a slide that looked a little bit like this. Because what they were doing was going through the process, again, that was described in that panel, which is looking at end-to-end -end processes, financial processes that affect customers, that cut across um, many functional areas in the bank, getting all those stakeholders into a room, mapping the customer journey, simplifying it, making it better for the customer. And, and what they all said is, it's a journey, not a, a destination. And it's one that they all agree is going to take several years to do. So, so we're in a situation where we want to transform. We want to be able to offer customers something different. Um, but it's a long journey, and it's a hard journey. And where does technology um, fit in? Um, well, I'm, I'm not really a technology person. And, and so technology, I find, is slightly scary. And I look at it really from a, um, a user perspective rather than, um, rather than a technology perspective. And the technology in banks is, is big and hairy and scary and complicated and difficult to change. So, so I'm going to try and, I suppose, boil it down a little bit um, and talk about how technology affects customers. You know, so if I'm a, a, I'm a bank's customer, how does, how does technology affect me? Well, in the past, um, we had CRM. And I remember, you know, I've been around quite a long time, I remember when CRM systems were first introduced. The, the big innovation was the customer profile. And the promise of the customer profile was that back in the old days, my bank manager knew who I was. That, that was the thing. He knew who I was. I came into the bank and said, hello, Mr. Franchise. He knew what I did. He knew how much money I earned. And he knew about my family, about my house. And, and CRM was an attempt to, to recreate that connection with customers in an environment where you've got thousands of customers and actually the branch manager doesn't know anything about you or who you are or what you do. So we keep your profile so that when you contact us, we can see who you are. And then we keep your case history. So every time you call us or every time you interact with us, we make a note of that. So the next time that you call us or the next time that you interact with us, um, we can use that history to inform the way that we deal with you. That, that was the promise. Um, and then the third promise of CRM was about single view. And, and single view is probably the, the single most difficult thing um, for banks to achieve. 
and, and I go into many banks all the time, and they've been working on single view for years, and they still have GPS. So single view is the idea that in my CRM or in my system, I can view all of the products, all of the services that a customer has. So, so when that customer contacts me, I know everything about them. I know if they've got a credit card, I know if they've got an insurance policy, I know if they've got a mortgage, I know how many accounts they've got. Single view. Those, those are the promises. Okay, in the future, we're really talking about this. And in the future, the things we're talking about are connected. So how many channels does a customer want to contact us through and how many can we use? And can we offer consistency across those channels? So, so if I Facebook uh, an organisation, um, and if I call them, um, do they know? I can tell you that they've done. I've had to do it recently with two financial services providers um, that I deal with. I Facebook them on their Facebook page. Um, they don't know who I am, so they could send me a thing back saying, can you identify yourself? But actually, most of the time, they choose not to do that. They send me back a Facebook message saying, please call our customer service department. I guess I've tried that, and if I wanted to do that, I would have done it. So I contacted you on Facebook because I was hoping for something different, and what I found is, you, you don't know who I am. And then, the most important thing is context. And context is different than history. Okay? Context is about knowing What's going on in my life at the moment? So that when I contact you as an organisation, you can do something different for me. So on a very simple level, if you like, if I've applied for a credit card, you know I've applied for a credit card, you know what stage of the process, that's it. You know that if I call you while that application is in process, the likelihood that I'm calling you to find out if that process has been completed and I'm going to get my credit card. So, so you know all that stuff. But when I call, what happens? I go to the IVR, I select my language, I select the credit card, I select application, and finally if I, you know, I get to speak to somebody who says your application is in process. Well, if you knew that anyway, and you knew that it was likely that I was going to call, why didn't you just, when I called, play me a message straight away that said, thank you for calling. Um, once you'd ID me and verified me, um, your credit card application has been approved, or your credit card ap application will be approved, and you saved me going through all that trouble. So you used context to provide me with a customised experience. And, and that's the next thing, customised experience. So, so giving people something that's different. So let's talk about mobile banking apps because we've heard those mentioned a few times. So the problem with most mobile banking apps is that I go to my mobile banking app, I log in. Now when I log in, that means you ID me and you verify me because you're about to let me have access to my account and you don't want to do that unless you're certain of who I am. So I go into my mobile banking app and I'm ID and I'm verified. And that means you know who I am. You know what products I have. You know my profile. You know that stuff. Um, but actually, my experience then is if I were to call you up while I'm in my banking app, for a start, I'd have to come out of the banking app and make a call on my phone because that, that's how it works. And then when I call you up, I'm through to the IVR, and I have to go through the whole process again. I have to ID myself, I have to verify myself. Um, because although you know who I am, you can't connect those two things. So, so wouldn't it be great if you could do that, if you could connect people um, from their mobile banking app into your system, so that if they did call you from, from their mobile banking app, you would know who they were. Um, and you could offer them other options. So rather than just taking their call, because you might not want to do that if you're very busy, you could offer them a chat session, you could offer them um, a 
call, you can offer them um, a call back. So that rather than uh, put them straight through to somebody in the call center, you could call them back. Well, well, can you do this stuff? Actually, yes, you can. And what about this whole IVR thing? Do you need to make the person, once they call, and go through that whole IVR? Actually, no, you don't. Because you can offer them the IVR on their phone. So they can choose where they want to go, press call, and then you can send them straight there. You don't have to make them go through that whole IVR. And they're already verified. They've already put their PIN number in. So you don't have to make them go through that stuff. You can simplify that experience for them and offer them a customized experience. Okay. And as I said, you don't have to take their calls um, if that's going to cause you problems in your contact center. You can actually offer people a call back um, and get back to them. So, so this is me, actually. This is me logged into my, um, my own banking website. So I'm logged in, I'm ID'd, I'm verified. I'm 52 years old, I'm a premier customer, and I'm looking at a property financing application form. Now, because I'm 52 and uh, you know, I'm not very technically savvy, I, I've always had problems when I go into the website and start filling out forms like I find they're far more complicated than I hope. Um, and quite often I end up having to call to, to get an explanation. What happens when I call? Well, I have to go through that whole thing. I have to identify who I am, I have to tell the person why I'm calling, I'm on the website, and so on and so forth. So given that I am who I am, and that uh, I'm in the website, and I'm looking at a, a mortgage loan application form, as a bank, wouldn't you like to reach out to me and maybe help me out with that? Um, now, you could push me something, for example, that offered me an opportunity to chat. But, but I'm 52, and to be perfectly honest, I don't want to chat with you. But you might offer me a callback, um, and, and you can trigger that callback based on my profile. I'm logged in, you know I'm a premier customer, you know I'm looking at a housing loan, Maybe I've looked at your housing loan calculator and, and done a calculation on a very big loan. So all of these rules you can use to trigger a contact that you make them. So when I say, yes, please, I'd like to have that, what, what happens? Well, somewhere in your organization, wouldn't it be great if given that I'm a platinum customer or a premium customer or whatever I am, you could route that transaction to one of your best people. So, so someone, for example, who's got great sales revenue, someone who has a very good record in converting these kind of opportunities. And, and the answer is, you can do that. You can do it because you know the context of my call. You know who I am, you know what I'm doing on your website, and so you can send this immediately to the right person. And that person can make a call to me, and, and they can introduce themselves by letting me know that they know who I am, and they know what I'm doing on their website. And not only that, but they can see it in front of them, and they can help me out. And, and that's a customised experience. And, and what happens if I'm not a premier customer? If I'm just a silver customer, for example? Well, we might not want to offer you that callback service because it's kind of expensive. So we might wait for you to call in. Um, but if you do, we still know that you've been on our website. And if we know that, again, we can customise your experience. We don't have to make you go through that whole IVR process. If you're in our website and you pick up the phone and call us, we know. We know you're in there, we know you're logged in. We can customize that experience and offer you something different when you call in. So you get the IVR and it doesn't say, please select your language or please select banking or credit card. It says, it looks as if you've been browsing our website. Can I, can I route you straight to a home loan specialist? And if you say yes, um, you can put that call right through to the right person they can see the website as well, and they can service that transaction for you. 
And then, and then there's this whole question of um, you know, other ways in which you can use your mobile phone. Um, have any of you had uh, an SMS from, from anyone that you deal with notifying you of something? I, I get them all the time, usually from my mobile phone company, telling me that I'm running out of credit. So they, they send me an SMS saying you're running out of credit. Well, what, can I reply to that SMS and say, oh, please extend my credit, or no. If I phone them up, having got one of those SMSs, do they know that they've sent me the SMS? No. I get through to the call center, I say, I've just received an SMS, they say, yes. I say, well, do you know what it's about? No. It comes from somewhere different. So, so they don't know. Does it have to be that way? Actually, no. It doesn't have to be that way. If you send someone out an SMS saying your insurance policy is up for renewal, you could actually let them SMS you back. Now, you might not want to um, renew somebody's policy on the basis of an SMS that they send back saying, yeah, great, I'd like to renew that. That, that might not be possible from a process perspective. But you can still take that SMS, and you can still send that SMS to somebody in the organization who can respond to it. And they might respond to that SMS by saying, we can't do this now, but what I can do is email you the forms, and then if you print them, scan them, and send them back to me, um, your insurance is going to be renewed. And, and that's a kind of, that's a cool service. And, and if I could do that, when my telco send me a, a message saying that my credit limit's being exceeded when I'm away traveling, I think I'd be very happy. And the technology exists. You can do that. So let's say that in this example, um, we do renew um, this guy's insurance policy. And because he's a kind of, millennial, and because he's into this kind of thing, the next thing he does is he tweets about you. So, so he tweets, and his tweet says, just renewed my car insurance with that bank um, while I was drinking a cup of coffee. How cool is that? That's his tweet. Now, the question is, do you care? Do you care that this guy is tweeting about you? Well, maybe you do, and maybe you don't. And what determines whether or not you care is how influential he is. Now, if he is a tech entrepreneur, and he's got thousands of followers, maybe hundreds of thousands of followers, and he tweets a positive tweet about your service, then you, you might care about that, because that's the kind of supporter that you need. So, so once he's tweeted about it, wouldn't it be great if you could then engage him through Twitter? Because that's what he's done. He's engaged with you through Twitter. Can, can you engage with him? And the answer again is, yes, you can. You can receive that tweet because it's what your company name mentioned in it. You can send that tweet to somebody in your organization, and that person can make a decision about what to do. Um, the bit about influence, that, that can be done automatically. You don't actually need to have a person to work that out. Um, there's, a, there's a thing called a clout score, um, which, which can calculate the influence of somebody in social media. And you can use that score to determine whether you actually want to handle these things or whether you just want to track them. Because you don't necessarily want to respond to every tweet or every Facebook posting or every LinkedIn mention of your company. But there are some of them that you might and you might want to respond to the negative ones, but you might also want to respond to the positive ones as well. So, so if somebody tweets a positive tweet about you and they're an influential person, um, what could you do? Well, you could tweet back to them saying, thanks for spreading the word, Mark. Check your mail. Um, we've got a special offer just for you. So you've engaged across channel. You've given that person um, an experience which is consistent You've demonstrated to them that you know who they are, however they contact you, and you've offered them something customised. And also, something that they weren't expecting. And in the, in the process, 
you've made it very easy for them. So, just to, to kind of round up, um, context. Um, when somebody calls, what do you know about them? And actually, some of the research um, suggests that in about 70 or 80 percent of cases, um, you could pre-identify why it is somebody is calling you based on something that you know about. Okay, so applications are a very straightforward thing. Um, if somebody's got an application for a credit card or for an insurance policy, um, they they might call you, and, and during that call, that's something that they might be asking. So, experience matters, and if you'd like to find out more about the kind of technology that will enable the things that I've talked about, so enable you to act on context, enable you to um, provide customised experiences to your customers, enable you to connect with them over various channels, and enable you to keep all of that consistent, um, come and see us at our booth outside um, with Genesis, just out there. And uh, we'd be very happy to talk to you. Thank you very much.